Got it. Our last video we looked at matrix multiplication and we learned that we can consider matrix multiplication to be what we get if we take a vector, transform it by a matrix B and then by a matrix A. Um, we found out that we can actually represent that by a single matrix AB and so that's kind of how we defined what the product of two matrices are. So with that in mind, one thing we'd quite like to know is if, the, if we transform a vector x into a times x, is it possible to come up with a transformation that kind of undoes that, that gets us back to x again? Um, for example, we know if we're working with numbers that if we multiply x by a, then we can undo that by dividing by a afterwards. So we'd like to know if there's a matrix equivalent of division, so to speak. So just one note, we're only go, really going to be looking at square matrices today. So we'll come back again to rectangular ones shortly. Okay, so the word that we're after here is we're looking for a matrix called a matrix inverse. So given an n by n matrix A, what we're looking for is a matrix, which we'll call A inverse, such that A inverse times A equals I, the identity. Why? Well, we know that I is the matrix equivalent of 1. And so if we're looking in the context of transformations, if we take A inverse times our transformed vector AX, then what that will give us is I times X, which will just give us X again. So if indeed we can actually find a matrix A inverse that behaves like that, i.e. the matrix A inverse that undoes A, then that will be the matrix that we're after, and our end result will just be X. So I'm going to give you one case straight off. If our matrix is two by two, there is a nice formula for its inverse, which is given by the following. So if I take my matrix to be A, B, C, D, then its inverse is equal to one over A, D minus B, C, all times the matrix D minus B minus C, A, where that number AD minus BC has got to be not equal to zero. So don't ask me how we got this. As far as we're concerned right now, it's complete black magic. <laughs> Just joking. Let um, me actually find out how to commute this thing, uh, calculate this thing quite soon. But for now, let's just check this magic expression and see that it does the right thing. Um, one little quick note before we do that though, that number AD minus BC, that is called the determinant of the matrix. And we require that it is non-zero non -zero in order to have an inverse, because otherwise we'd be dividing by zero. Um, and we can, we can define determinants later on in the course for bigger matrices, but just a little note, so this is the first time we've seen one of these. Okay, so let's check our formula. So I'm going to do A inverse times A, so that will be 1 over AD minus BC, times D minus B minus CA, times the matrix A, B, C, D, now let's do that matrix multiplication. So we'll still have the scalar 1 over AD minus BC outside. And inside I can see that I get DA, which is AD, minus BC in the 1, 1 position. Then I get DB minus BD, that's just 0, in the 1, 2 position. Then I get negative CA plus AC, that just gives me 0 in the row 2, column 1. And then in the row 2, column 2, I get negative BC plus AD. That's just that number AD minus BC again. Then you can see that's, it. that's just the determinant on the diagonals there. So that comes out to be our identity 1, 0, 0, 1. OK, so supposing we can find such an inverse, um, what can we do it? do with it? Well, firstly, we can use it to solve a system of linear equations. So consider the equation a times x is equal to b. Now if we left multiply this equation, so don't forget the order is very important when, we, when it comes to multiplying by matrices. So if we left multiply by a inverse on both sides, then what we see is a inverse times ax is equal to a inverse times b. Now a inverse a, that's just the identity. So that translates to being x is equal to a inverse times b. Now, there's one very important note, though, before we get too excited and just want to do this all the time to solve systems. This is actually a very nice mathematical construction, but practically speaking, if we solve systems by calculating the inverse of the matrix, then multiplying our right-hand side by it, it turns out that this is not a good idea, numerically speaking. Remember, whenever we solve a system of equations on a computer, we're only representing the numbers to a finite level of accuracy. And this me method of solving equations can actually amplify rounding errors 
quite significantly. So practically speaking, to solve a system, Gaussian elimination and back substitution is still the correct method. However, this inverse method is quite conceptually very useful and will be very helpful when it comes to manipulating expressions involving matrices. Okay, so maybe I've convinced you that we might be interested in calculating inverses, or maybe I've told you that it's a silly idea, but either way, let's see if we can devise a method of calculating the inverse of any matrix. So what we're going to do is we're going to try to start to find our first column of A inverse. Now remember, our matrix vector product, that just gives us a linear combination of the columns of our matrix. So if I want the first column of A inverse, that will just be the matrix A inverse times 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0. Um, or we could write that if we multiply both sides through by A, that gives us a system A times column 1 is equal to E1. So remember that vector is just called E1 with the 1 in the first position. So we could conceivably find this column by setting up the augmented matrix with A on the left and then E1 being our right hand side. We'd then go ahead and take it to reduced ratio on form, which hopefully would turn the A part into I, and we'd get I and column 1 in the right, because column 1 should be our solution. In a similar way, we can find column 2 by attacking the matrix A partitioned with E2, that augmented matrix, and then to reduce that to reduced ratio on form, um, and that will give us. Um, I and column 2. And also worth noting and really important that it's going to be exactly the same row operations in both of those two cases to get those first two columns. So what we can do with that sort of myth idea in mind is we can find all of the columns at once by basically forming a super big augmented matrix where we have A on the left and we have all of the columns E1, E2 through to EN on the right. Now that thing on the right there, that's actually just the identity. If you write those column vectors down side by side, you can see that's just the n by n identity matrix. So our augmented matrix is really just A uh, augmented with I. So what, we should what should happen then is if we reduce this whole thing and aim to take our left partition to the identity, then at the end, the right-hand partition will just be all of the columns of A inverse. It's like we did all those separate augmented matrices, but we just did them in one batch. So that will actually, that right hand partition should just be the matrix A inverse itself. Okay, um, but not all matrices are invertible. And if A inverse doesn't exist, then what we'll find is that when we try and reduce A to I, by the time we've finished the first phase, that is the Gaussian elimination phase, we'll find that we do not have a full set of N pivots on the left of the matrix after our reduction. At that point in time, we can just say our matrix is not invertible and just stop. So let's see how this works in practice. We'll try and find the inverse of a 3 by 3 matrix. Let's see if we can find the inverse of A, which is equal to 1, 2, negative 3, negative 2, negative 3, 8, and 2, 6, negative 1. So we'll start by setting up our augmented matrix with an identity to the right there. And we're going to first do Gaussian elimination on it to reduce it to row echelon form and hope we have a full set of pivots on the left. Okay, so I'm not going to run through all the details here super quick. But once we've done those first three row operations, we have a full set of pivots. You can see the three of them there. The fact that they're ones, that was just a coincidence. Um, that's, that, that will not happen necessarily automatically. But the key thing is we have those three pivots so we can continue with our gauss jordan elimination to reduced row echelon form. All right, and here we have it. On the left, there is the identity. And on the right, we have this slightly weird looking thing. Negative 45, negative 16, 7. 14, 5, negative 2. Negative 6, negative 2, 1. So what that means is that A inverse, where A was how we defined it at the start, is the matrix negative 45, negative 16, 7. 14, 5, negative 2. Negative 6, negative 2, and 1. 
So you can go ahead and check as an exercise that it is indeed true that a inverse times a is equal to that entity, and it should also be true that a times a inverse, okay, the multiplication in the other order, also gives you the identity. And you can go ahead, if you want to, and find the 2 by 2 matrix inverse formula that we that I showed you earlier by doing this exact method. Okay, now we'll do one more example. This is the example of what we call a diagonal matrix. It's a matrix with non-zero entries only on its main diagonal. That's the entries 1, 1, 2, 2, etc. And it's got zeros everywhere else. So my matrix D is going to be D11, D22 through to DNN on its diagonal and zeros elsewhere. Now, if we were to apply our method, let's just do it on our heads, we don't really need to write it down this time. You can see that when we're reducing D to the identity, the only operations we actually need to do are scalar multiples of each row by 1 over DII to make the pivot on row I equal to 1. So hopefully you can sort of see that the inverse is going to come straight out to be D inverse is another diagonal matrix. This time it'll be 1 over D11. 1 over d22, all the way through to 1 over dnn, with zeros everywhere else. This obviously tells us that those d's all have to be non-zero, or this thing is not going to work out. Okay, so let's finish off by some useful properties of our inverse. So the inverse obeys some, some pretty useful algebraic properties. So first one, if we have the product of matrices, a times b, and we want to take its inverse, then provided that a and b are both square and invertible, then this will equal B inverse times A inverse. Okay, so just a little note there. Um, if we, if it's possible that AB, A times B will be invertible, where A and B themselves are not, but if they both are, then that's what we'll get. And you can check that one by literally multiplying AB times that inverse expression, and you'll get the identity. Second property, um, CA inverse, Okay, I'm taking a scalar times A and the inverse now. That's just equal to 1 over C times A inverse for some non-zero scalar C. Okay, you can see this one by multiplying it out as well. 1 over C times A inverse times CA. Well, I can bring all the scalars out to the front. So that equals C over C times A inverse times A, which is just 1 times the identity, which is just the identity as we would have hoped. Um, property number three, the inverse is its own identity. If you try and invert that, you just get itself. So I guess we'll just wrap up with a little note about manipulating algebraic equations involving matrices. Um, so we now have enough tools that we can use our various properties to manipulate equations that do involve matrices and vectors. So note that we can expand parentheses, just like with vectors, so long as we make sure that our products, whenever we're taking matrix, matrix products, that they're always consistent Remember the inner and our um, dimensions must agree. So for example, if we wanted to solve the following for the matrix A, and in fact, let's just assume that our matrix is a square for this problem. So we've got CA plus D is equal to negative A. Then we'd first group the A terms on the left and move the D across to the right to give us CA plus A is negative D. Then I'm going to factorize that. And remember that instead of writing 1 for the 1 times A, we're going to use the identity. So this will become C plus I times A is equal to negative D. And noting that I plays the role of 1 for matrices. So what this gives us is A is therefore equal to negative C plus I inverse. I'm left multiplying by C plus I inverse on both sides times D. And you can see that negative sign came out the front because it's just like a scalar negative 1. And we can always bring these out the front of our expressions. Okay, so now we know about inverses of matrices and a little bit about manipulating um, expressions involving these. And in particular, we know how to reduce a, uh, sorry, how to produce an inverse of a matrix by just using our same gauss jordan elimination we've been doing earlier to take it to reduced racial on form. Okay, so we'll call it quits for this one, um, and we'll see you next time. Kakite ano.